Today, we're diving into the world of cellular automata, a digital playground of sorts where simple rules lead to astonishing complexity, where order can arise from chaos and collapse back into chaos just as quickly. Patterns are everywhere, from the spirals of a seashell to the galaxies in our universe. The real world's imprecise analog nature makes these patterns seem almost expected. Of course sand formed ripples in the wind, that's what sand does. Clouds are wispy in the sky, because that's what clouds are. Well, what if I told you the rigid and logical world of computing can give rise to equally complex and surprising patterns? Indeed, machines that cannot even generate truly random numbers are capable of creating suspiciously natural patterns. In the 1940s and 50s, John von Neumann, known for pioneering the stored program concept for computers, explored self-replicating machines and devised the idea of cellular automata. They're a kind of simulation that works on a grid of cells. Each cell follows simple rules based on their own state and the neighbouring states, generating complex patterns from like pretty basic initial conditions. But how can lines of structured code create anything but repeatable and precise results? That's kind of the point of computers. They're electronic machines that predictably follow the rules. In fact, the predictable and logical nature of code is one of the many reasons many people enjoy programming. It's a complete contrast to the unpredictable and illogical real world. Let's take a look. Firstly, at things called one-dimensional cellular autom- Cellular automata. Uh, I'm gonna call those CAs from now on, because that word is hard to say. So, what you do is you take a one-dimensional array where each element represents a cell. The cell can either be alive or dead, a one or a zero. By applying simple binary logic-based rules to each cell and its immediate neighbors, it's possible to generate a new generation of cells. These cells are then used to create the next generation, and so on. And you put each successive generation underneath the previous one, going down the screen. And if you do that, it results in some quite amazing patterns. A large amount of research into this was done by British-American scientist Stephen Wolfram, whose organization you might have heard of, Wolfram Research. They developed the Wolfram Alpha Computational Knowledge Engine website. Wolfram the person devised a classification system for 1D CAs. Turns out there's quite a lot of them. So let's examine a few and see how the code behind them relates to the images. So what you're looking at at the moment is known as rule 30. It draws a pattern very similar to patterns seen on seashells. As you can imagine, this thoroughly captivated mathematicians and computer scientists when they first saw it. Imagine looking at lines of rigid computer code and watching as it generates patterns that you might see in nature. You see, here was machinery generating natural patterns. It shouldn't really be able to do this. It seems a bit weird. Well, the logic behind rule 30 is incredibly simple. It's almost too simple. This is kind of the point of CAs. They look really simple, but make really complex output. Imagine you wanted to draw this pattern. How might you go about it? You know, you're thinking that like, somehow you've got to make a complex sequence of logic to draw all these individual shapes. Well, this is the magic behind these things. There's no complex logic. It's just really basic rules that interact with each other in quite surprising ways. Here's how rule 30 works. For each cell in the current row, you do the following logical operation to calculate whether that cell is alive or dead on the next row. You get the left cell, you exclusive or it with the current cell or the right cell, and that's it. If you do that, you draw patterns that nature makes appear on seashells. The patterns emerge from the rules, but the rules don't directly define the patterns. Another automaton is called rule 90, and it's even simpler. The state of the cell is simply its left neighbor, exclusive or with its right neighbor. If you don't know what an exclusive or is, it's a Boolean operator that just takes two binary inputs and returns a one if the inputs are different. That's all it does. And from that, we can draw this amazing pattern. If you're slightly curious about fractals and this part of maths and computing, you'll instantly recognize what this shape is. It's called the Sapinski triangle, usually generated by recursively dividing a triangle into smaller and smaller sub-triangles. Well, here's some basic XOR operator that's doing it for us. Hopefully you're starting to appreciate this area of computing is thoroughly captivating to not only computer scientists, but mathematicians and kind of even philosophers. Logically, if nature-like patterns could be created by lines of code, 
can we model nature in our computers? Well, we sort of try to do that with the weather and everything. Currently there's a storm blowing outside my room. You might be able to hear it. And we knew that was happening because we modelled the unpredictable nature of the world inside our computers. Let's get into the meat of the topic and look at two-dimensional CAs. Like most things, adding an extra dimension increases complexity. You make a 2D game and you suddenly think, oh, I'll make a 3D game. Your game's just got infinitely more complex. Well, you've no doubt seen the classic example of a two-dimensional CA, John Conway's life. There's countless videos about it already, but let's have a look how it works. So you start with a 2D grid. The grid is supposed to be infinite, which is a bit awkward in a computer. So I like to make the edges wrap, like in asteroids, where if you go off one edge, you appear on the opposite edge. For each cell on the grid, you apply the following rules. If the cell is dead, but it has exactly three neighbors, you mark it as alive in the next cycle. Otherwise it stays dead. If the current cell is alive and it's got less than two neighbors, it dies off in the next cycle. If it's got exactly two or three neighbors, it remains alive. And if it's got more than three neighbors, it dies. Or in plain English, a cell remains alive if it has exactly two or three neighbors. It can come back alive if it's got exactly three neighbors. Otherwise it's dead. These incredibly basic and simple rules interact in extraordinary ways, and that's kind of the point of this whole thing. The rules are simple, but the output is really unpredictable. The whole system is also Turing complete. Some patterns die out quickly, others evolve into another pattern, some alternate between two different states, and some just explode into an intensely complex pattern that seems totally random. It may then collapse back down into a very simple pattern again and repeat that cycle. Some of the patterns seem built into the environment. If you randomly put down cells and run the simulation, some patterns will consistently emerge from it. So consistently, they've been given names. We're gonna look at a few of the most common. So this little shape wiggling around on the screen is called a glider. It's a group of cells that moves across this grid by themselves. They're kind of like self-propelled. This type of arrangement here is called a gun, because it shoots gliders. This kind of simulation had philosophers and mathematicians wondering about the nature of existence when it was initially discovered. Ideas like maybe our reality is just a big simulation in some large computer or something. You know, philosophers have got to do something with their time. Although it's more likely that being a product of a universe where seashells exist and birds fly in self-arranging flocks, causes computers that also exist in that universe to exhibit the same patterns and behavior. You know, like how those very simple shapes we saw inside life just happen because that's kind of how the rules make it happen. Maybe all this pattern stuff that we see in the world is just how the world is. If you've heard of the term emergent behavior before, or played with things called voids, come back for a future video. I've got a whole idea about that as well. I generally like code that makes pretty random patterns looks quite interesting. Incidentally, if you Google for Conway's life, a simulation of it runs on your screen inside the browser. It's one of those really nice hidden Easter eggs that Google puts in. It's also been discovered that life can simulate logic gates. You can lose hours playing with this. And if you want to, I've got a Python program that simulates it, which I've linked down in the description with a bunch of other code that I've used in this video. So that's life, a pretty captivating 2D environment like scooping up a dish of water from a pond and sticking it underneath a microscope. Let's look at another one that's not as well known, but equally fascinating. This is wire world. It simulates electrical impulses flowing along wires. No, it's not accurate, but it kind of gets the idea across. You can draw a wire on the screen. Then you can place what's called an electron head and an electron tail onto the wire. And it travels along the wire to the end. If you make a loop, it will continue circling. This is also Turing complete because of course it is. It seems that most complex things eventually are. Maybe that's another product of a computer being in this universe. It can eventually simulate itself. Wouldn't surprise me if we're just walking Turing machines and that simulating logic gates is just somehow part of the way the universe functions. I like Wireworld because it's colorful. And if you're really, really dedicated, there's a possibility of creating quite elaborate simulations using it. Someone here has made a seven segment display. 
It's not as famous as Conway's life, maybe because it requires quite a lot of human input to make anything happen. It feels less alive, you can't just like splat some starter cells in and off it goes. You've got to think up what you want to make in it. And I find as soon as you've got to put your own input in, it gets a bit less interesting. We all like hitting a button and watching a thing appear. That's why AI art has gone bonkers. You can say words and pictures appear. CAs might seem quite magical in how they work, but the same input always produces the same output. The system is repeatable and predictable. This pattern is called an acorn. It's an example of something called a Methuselah, a type of pattern that seems utterly random, but eventually stabilizes into a predictable pattern. This one takes 5,206 generations to do that, but it will always do it. The way order can turn into chaos and then go back to order again is a topic that's intrigued mathematicians, computer scientists, and seemingly screenwriters for decades. The shorthand is the, the butterfly effect. A butterfly can flap its wings in Peking and in Central Park you get rain instead of sunshine. The complex systems shown in Conway's life are a good example of what is known as emergent behavior. Complexity arises from simple starting conditions. Ever notice how birds fly in a formation? And yet there isn't actually a lead bird giving any orders. Or how shoals of fish will keep cycling around to avoid a predator without colliding with each other, giving rise to seemingly thoughtful patterns. The chaotic behaviour seen in Rule 30 is an example of how simple rules can mimic patterns seen in nature. It's important to understand these patterns naturally evolve out of the rules. They aren't specifically programmed in any more than the spiral of a sunflower seeds isn't programmed into the Fibonacci sequence. It just appears because that's how things are. Importantly, trying to make your own versions is a great way to learn computer science. I could have made this video by pasting snippets of Wikipedia on the screen and recycling other people's videos, but I decided to write my own code. The rules are so simple and approachable that they can be easily understood, but making them turns into a good challenge. So go and grab your favorite programming language and try to recreate Conway's life. I did it once using Z80 and it was quite difficult, but it did work. And once you've got it working, it's a much more interesting equivalent of just writing hello world when you learn something new. And because it's widely documented, it's very, very easy to test whether the program works at the end or not. You just copy someone else's examples and see if they function the same. So if you're still watching, thanks for sticking to the end, but don't stop here. On my GitHub, which I've linked below, is a repo with all the code that I've been using in this video. It's written in Python and it requires nothing more than Pygame. So go download the code and have a play. And I'll see you in the next video. <laughs> Sorry, internet, I'm trying to look less like a stunned rabbit in front of a camera. So I've got hands, grew them over Christmas. Today, we're diving into the world of reading our auto prompt and trying to think and talk at the same time. It's been about a month since I've done this and it's really difficult. So we're gonna try again.